Three, two, one. Hi everyone and welcome back to The Process. Today I will be talking to a good friend and mentor of mine, Lisa Lang, who's an incredible journalist, a journalist I grew up looking up to and watching on television. And I thought it would be amazing to talk to her about the process of building trust with people, specifically in the context of communicating each other's stories. And this isn't just for journalists, but just as individuals and humans to be able to connect with one another with our stories. And then also the process of thinking independently, being able to think for yourself when you are watching television, you're consuming any form of media, um, being able to understand what your actual thoughts and opinions are before someone else tells you. So welcome to this episode of The Process. Okay, I never thought I would be here <laughs> interviewing you. I feel like it's typically the other way around. And now we have this like boomerang effect where I'm down. two people who, but okay, so maybe I'm a little bit nervous because I've watched you do this for a very long time and I've learned a lot from you. Do you remember the first time we met? Of course I do, I could never forget. <laughs> Wait, really? Yeah, I mean, it was like, what, 10 years ago? It was, my, it was a long time ago. It was almost 10 years ago, it was my 18th birthday. Yeah, and we were, I, I was speaking at some event and this, yeah cute little girl comes up to me and it's just like, I'm the biggest fan and I've watched all of your work. And I, I mean, you were just, you made an impact. You know, it was a birthday gift. So the person that I was interning for, who's like my big sister now, was like, because it was November, my birthday is November 27th. And she was like, for your birthday, I'm going to go take you to meet Lisa Ling. And I was like, you're nah. -uh. And she was like, yeah, I got invited to this dinner because she had spoken the year before. And it was like the most it was the most memorable thing and I was so happy. And the thing that I actually remember was because at the time, like one of my like dream jobs was like being on a more like a morning talk show and like having conversations about topics and like the view, I was watching the view with my mom all the time and we talked about it. And I remember you saying like, it was the most like, it's literally a dream job. It's so glamorous. You have like all of the, you know, yeah. whatever the clothes and the events and all of this stuff. But you had always talked about how like it, it just wasn't your thing because you wanted to talk about like harder topics. And when you yeah. would pitch them, it was like, that's it just not what we do. It wasn't fulfilling for sure. Yeah. And so I guess my question to you, well, to start off is, do you call yourself a journalist? I do. And first of all, I couldn't forget that that moment when we met because you were so adorable, first of all, and so Am I still adorable persistent. Too? Of course. <laughs> oh my god. I feel like I kind of like I feel like you're my kid. Yes. I, I, um, you were so persistent in a way that was really endearing. Thank and you. I can see how that persistence has been part of your process. Yeah. Because you won't take no for an answer. You are, but again, like it's in this endearing way where people just want to get to know you and That's want to talk really to you. Um, you. And you're so deferential and um, just kind and generous. Thank and you. so I think, um, you know, it's everything that has happened has been beyond serendipitous. So anyway. That's very true. And like you have become such an incredible mentor to me. It's like I always felt, I mean, you were always an example to me, but you became an incredible mentor because I always felt like I could just come to you with like, this is what I'm doing or this is like something I put out. And now being like having other people reach out to me about those things, like you're always a reflection I go back to because I'm like, well, if Lisa didn't do that for me, like then I wouldn't have this type of guidance or this type of knowledge. And so well, it's really important. So it's like, thanks. I'm trying to pay it forward. Thanks well, to you. Well, I'm glad. And and I mean, I do, I, I absolutely consider myself a, a journalist because um, what I do is I go out and I immerse myself in different worlds and different community communities. And I try to communicate people's stories and people's worlds to yeah. a bigger audience. And in many ways, I think that while my reporting may not be headline news every night. It may not be breaking news. I, I, I think it's as journalistic as anything that you would see uh, on any broadcast news show. But in my opinion, almost more so because what you do and what I've always looked up to is that you actually spend time with communities and getting to know them and building trust with them. And that's how you tell the stories that you do. And to me, 
as someone whose community is often misrepresented and because our communities are often misrepresented, the headlines are very skewed. It doesn't feel right that people report on it the way that they do. And so I appreciate, like I, we, we came to watch the screening of one of your This Is Life episodes on domestic terrorism. And I remember when you told me like the first time about the topic, I was like, okay, so how exactly are you covering this? Because, you know, this is something that like is not only such a sensitive topic, but it's something that when you cover it, if you don't cover it in a way that like really takes into account the perspective and the impact that it has on the community that you're talking about, it becomes dangerous to, in this case, like Muslim Americans. And when I watched it, I was so like, not just pleasantly surprised, but I had learned so much myself. So how have you taken that concept of objectivity and incorporated that into the way that you tell the stories you do as a journalist today? Well, I mean, I, I have the luxury of being able to do the show where we are encouraged to go find the stories. Yeah. And and that's that is very unusual in the in the media landscape. I mean, I think most broadcast journalists, they're sent to cover stories and they aren't allowed the freedom to actually do journalism because in many ways they're sort of regurgitating news that is already has already broken, right? Or that has already been reported. Whereas with our show, we may pitch a topic, you know, we may go out and explore a world, but once we hit the ground, if we realize that might not be the story that, that, that we should be telling, we have the license to be able to say, well, this is the actual story. Yeah. And that's a pretty unusual thing to be able to do. You know, I think so often you almost have to sell the story before you go out and report it. So you're basically just reporting things again, that, that you've already heard or that, has already, that, that have already been reported. Whereas for us, um, we almost have you know, a pretty blank canvas where we can go and really, really immerse. We don't have the kinds of time constraints where we're trying to solicit sound yeah. bites from people. We can actually have conversations. And for me, that's when the best stuff always emerges, when you get a chance to talk to people and allow them to speak. You know, I'm, my job is not to interrogate you. My job is not to try and get you to say something that I've already heard. My job as a journalist is try, to try to talk to you, to, um, to better understand why you do what you do, why you believe what you believe. And, and therefore, I think that what we often come away with is, is a more accurate journalistic account of those people's lives. Do you think that it's possible to use that mindset in reporting day-to-day -day news today? I think it's a lot harder. I mean, I think it, it absolutely is possible. And, uh, you know, that, that is reflected in print journalism. But for broadcast journalism, you know, most journalists get like... 10 minutes max and and for 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 That's for long. the for the, for the for the magazine shows yeah. but for the daily news shows maybe 2 minute two, packages minutes, yeah. and so it's really difficult to be able to have those kinds of conversations you haven't always had your own show but i do feel like your career trajectory hasn't been like it's still yeah it hasn't been traditional and so you are on whether it was like with The View or with Oprah or with Nat Geo, like you were still doing things um, your way consistently. But was there ever a transitional period where you realized that this was your formula, that this was the best way that you could tell the stories you were telling? I definitely did have a very non-traditional path yeah. to, to getting to where I am. And I have to attribute the genesis of that to the show called Channel One News, which was yep. a show that was seen in schools across the country. In fact, yeah. Anderson Cooper was one of my colleagues. Uh, and because it was seen in schools, they wanted young looking correspondents right. to, to report the news. So I was in my early 20s, but they wanted me to kind of look like I look like any of the students that we were, um, you know, reporting to. And so that show allowed me to just be me. And I didn't have to fit some kind of formula, formulaic kind of interpretation of what a reporter should look like or be like. They what just sound wanted, like. yeah, they just wanted very organic kinds of people who. Um, who, who, who were just being themselves. And so that allowed us, when we went into the field, to um, just employ a much more informal 
experiential style to our reporting. It was really different from anything that you saw on television, on yeah. broadcast news. And I guess you could say we, I just continued that style. Um, if you look at what I did 20 years ago at Channel One, it's very similar to what yeah. I do now. It really is. My reporting style is very, um, it, 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 it's, it's just not formal because it's very conversational. And so I guess you could say, you know, I think that the audience responds to that, you know? I think yeah. it, 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 I think people feel more comfortable. And they, they see you as a person. Exactly, So exactly. like, why do you think that we're taught to fit into a mold when it comes to being a reporter? Sounding a like I I remember in college I saved up all of I was interning at a local television station I was working an overnight shift at another radio station and I saved up all my money I spent it on this voice coach because I wanted to talk just like all the reporters and I was like this is it. and then I remember having this realization with when one of my mentors was like your voice is great use your voice like and and hone in on that and you can always work on your voice and work on like the way that yeah you speak, I mean I, I think things have changed a lot I mean when I was young which is a lot. Which is yesterday. <laughs> I know. Um, you had to kind of fit into a box because there were so few outlets out there. Mm -hmm. Things have changed now. I mean, there's such such a wide array of journalistic outlets now that I think you can be more of yourself and you don't have to fit into that box. I mean, back in the day, there were you know, three, I mean, I'm not that old, but, but, but when I was sort of coming up in business, there were three networks, right, that had news shows. And the idea was to be able to deliver those stories in a, uh, a, a, a an unbiased, nonpartisan yeah. kind of way, and almost to regurgitate the things that you were were hearing or the things that were happening in the news. And I think now there there are so many outlets, there's so many different sources, there's the internet. Well, that's the thing is it's the I think those outlets are more focused on the internet. I think when you talk about network news and local news though, that hasn't changed as much. It it it, it has. I mean, I think it has. The formula has changed, but probably not not nearly as much as how do you, as the how web. Have you seen it changed? I do think that 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 network and you know that includes cable news is more personality driven now, and I think that uh, opinion. I think it, it, th th there there is no longer a fear of injecting one's opinion because I, th I do think that there is value in reporting news objectively. Right. right? I mean, and for me, even though. I may inject my feelings about things. When you watch our shows in the end, I, 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 I still do think that we report pretty objectively. I do think Because we do, allow yeah. people to have, uh, to have their voices heard, you know? And we allow, um, allow people to have experiences and we give them the tools to, to kind of formulate their own opinion or their own feeling about what we're reporting. Whereas today, it's like this heavy-handed um, pontification, right? And, and heavy-handed, I'm going to tell you what to think. But it also takes us to like a place of, do, like, are our opinions our own now? Because when you're on social media, specifically, I think, like, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well, but you're trapped in this echo chamber of thoughts and opinions that are very similar to your own. And when something happens, like when an issue happens, when an event happens, um, we often don't have time to sit with what happened and formulate our own thoughts before being bombarded with everyone else's. Well, yeah, there's no, there's no fact checking on, on streaming and on social media. I mean, you're just sort of spewing or you're retweeting or you're commenting, right? Or you're, you're just, cranking out stories without taking that time to fact, yeah. fact check things. And I also do think, I mean, you and I have talked about this personally, that while social media has been revolutionary in allowing news to travel very quickly, it, it, it also is incredibly dangerous because yeah. I'm as guilty as the next person of following only the, the people who espouse 
the opinions and the feelings that I espouse, right? Yeah. And so when you do that, your worldview becomes so small mm -hmm. because there is such value and importance in knowing how the rest of the world thinks, but we essentially shut ourselves off to it. And, and in some ways, I think we become like North Korea, but we're choosing to live that way. In North Korea, they're prevented from knowing how the rest of the world thinks. But here, we choose to isolate ourselves. And, and I find that to be incredibly dangerous as well. But there are, if you seek it out, there are a lot more sources of information available to you. But you have to really seek it out, and that's the problem. I don't think people do. I think we become really, really lazy yeah. in following exactly the people who, who, who espouse our, our views. Well, so if we were to ask you, then how does one truly think for themselves today regarding using social media, how would you answer that? I mean, for me, I, I think that's why I, I feel so strongly about what I'm able to do um, and why, why it's so important to me because our show, I think, is one of the few shows where we try really, really hard to allow people to tell their stories. People who might think very differently from me, people who may be considered to you know, be part of a marginalized or a fringe culture or society yeah. in some cases, and we allow people to talk so that our objective is that the audience can just get a better understanding of their fellow human. Yeah. And I just don't think we are doing that enough. And I think that over the years, you know, we talk about gaining trust with people. Over the years, people have seen on, on our show, our, my current show, This Is Life on, on CNN, and my previous show, Our America on OWN, that we do give people a chance yeah. to have their voices heard. And, and therefore, people um, are, are more trusting with us than I think that they, they might be with other outlets. Oh, yeah, and it shows through so much because you, talk, you have had conversations with very controversial people. But I also want to ask you about the building, having people trust you and how you've been able to gain people's trust because you are vocal online about political things and your opinions. Do you ever, like when you're about to post something political, think to yourself, oh, I don't want somebody I'm trying to interview to see this and then turn down the interview because I, I really want to talk to this community, but like maybe they'll see this and be like, oh, I'm not going to talk to her. Yeah, I mean, I have learned to be a lot more cautious on social media because I don't want to alienate people. I really don't because I, I my whole objective is to try and better understand each other so that what we're doing can help other people better understand people who are different from them. And so while I may express an opinion, because I am as guilty as anyone for having my own opinions, um, I will often ask a question. I might, I might yes, say something I like, this. yes, because I, I, I do... I want to hear other people's perspective. Yeah. And I feel like your audience too are your viewers and your viewers are so diverse. They are diverse and I can't tell you how many times people have said to me on social media, um, I totally disagree with everything that you espouse mm -hmm. or you stand for, but I love your show and I think you're really fair. I've seen that. And that's a huge, huge compliment to me. That's the biggest compliment yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, because I, I want people to know that while I may have an opinion, um, about this, that, and the other, I will still sit here and listen to you and want to understand you and find value in your story. Exactly. And I just think that, that we're not doing that enough. You know, these days, as far as broadcast news is concerned, we're going in with this agenda, right? Yeah. And if you don't say what I want you to say or what you've said elsewhere, then I'm going to attack you and continue to attack you. And I just find it that to be really counterproductive. Do you think that's just for ratings, though? Or do you think people really feel like they have to get that out there? I mean, I think it's a little bit of both, you know? I mean, I, I think that with our current president, he rates, right? And so the more we cover him, the, 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 the better the chances are that we're going to rate. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's the biggest reality show in town. And so... While we may have this 
um, this true desire to want to kind of get beneath or to um, upend some of the things that he is doing. Um, I think we also have to recognize that the more we exclusively cover him, the more we're alienating all the other sto stories that are happening in the world, of which there are many, and we're almost feeding that machine, right? Yeah. Feeding, feeding the beast. It almost is our feels like out of control. Like it's like sometimes the way that I think about it is: is there ever going to be a moment where we can all take a pause and just like reel things back in and like give ourselves just a, a reality check of like how we're going about reporting and like what that is doing directly impacting communities. And I think like for you and I, the only thing that we really can do is tell stories the way that we feel like is right. And for me, one of the questions I always ask before I go in, into a story is how is the way I cover this going to impact the person or the community that I'm talking about? Because I need to make sure that they are protected, that their story and their truth is protected and like that we aren't putting them in danger because I've seen what that's done. So what is your process in making sure that when you go into a subject, whether it because you've interviewed sex workers, gang members, like people who are in prison, how do you protect their truth? It's a it's a great question. Um, the people who share their stories with me, they have in some cases shared things that they've never even shared with their closest friends or family members, yeah. and and in doing so, we have shared a moment that is so intimate and so personal that I feel this intense obligation to make sure that I tell the story correctly and responsibly um, and, and allow you to be sure that um, you're comfortable telling this story, yeah. right? I mean, I can never guarantee that someone's going to be happy with what I report, but, but I will have communicated to you mm -hmm. the consequences of saying certain things, or I will make sure that you feel as comfortable as you could possibly feel sharing this story. I can't guarantee that you're going to like what we report, but I can guarantee that I will never intentionally malign you yeah. or try and um, put you in a position where you regret telling your story. Has anyone ever reached out to you feeling like they were misrepresented in one of your episodes? And how do you deal with that? I would say that in about 90 episodes of television. That's a lot. And I'm episodes. not kidding, 90 episodes between This Is Life and Our America, yeah. we've produced about that many. We've maybe had two people in 90 episodes who have been displeased with how they were uh, portrayed in, in one of our shows. One of them is uh, an adult film actress who um, thought that we were maligning the porn industry, <laughs> which... Well, I have... We weren't, but I, I mean, I, I would say that that was, that was... In that space. Yeah. And that's like a hard community to build trust with in my well, state. Well, it is because they are people who have been so stigmatized. So I exactly. understand it. Totally. Which is why I try really hard before anyone agrees to do an interview with us to make sure they know what they're they're about to do mm -hmm. and 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 to make sure they know that there are going to be a lot of eyeballs on this interview. Um, and and even so uh, you know, of those two women who were displeased, one of them um, is no longer because she and I communicate, and I think that she just was she she didn't didn't appreciate how many people were going to see the interview. Yeah. So it wasn't even as much about the content; uh, it was more just kind of she just didn't kind of realize. I mean, two out of that many episodes, and we're not even talking about how many people are in the episode, each episode, like that's an incredible amount. And so how do you actually build trust with those people before you hit the record button? 
Well, I mean, I have this incredible team of people. I mean, you don't work on my show unless you're a really sensitive person and, and you appreciate that people have lives beyond yeah. an interview. Um, team is everything. Yeah, and I, and I can't say enough about how incredible, I mean, they're all young and, you know, passionate and sensitive and, and really understand that there are serious consequences for people when these shows come out, if they, you know, talk about things that they haven't shared with their family members or their yeah. friends. Um, so that's one. And two, I think we have a proven track record because our shows, there have been so many of them, and I think people can people will see that we may take an organization or a group of people that you have an opinion about, and we will provide you with an experience that you may have otherwise never been able to have, and, and, and hopefully a deeper understanding of why people make the choices that they do. Um, and I also give everyone my cell phone number. <laughs> I really do. I, if you are going to share with me something so deeply personal, um, I want you to know that you can call me and talk to me about it anytime. I may not pick up the phone all the time, but you have my number, and if you want to talk to me about it, Really? I, yes, because, you know, I, I, I feel this incredible attachment to a lot of the people that I, I interview because we've shared moments with each other that even I have no. never shared with, with the people closest to me. And there's something that happens when you do that. It's like I am not the kind of person who, 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 who would allow you to share the depths of your heart and your soul and then say goodbye, thank you. That's it. Um, I want people to know that that they can call me and that yeah. that that the relationship that we have built is a real relationship. Yeah, I think that it's so you like put to words this not even words. You painted an image right now, like to something that I've always said, which is that I think that interviews, in especially in settings like this, should be a mutual exchange. Like I. No one owes us their story, and if they're giving you that, then you should be able to give a part of yourself as well, because otherwise, like, why should they trust you, and how do you build on that connectivity? And it's almost an exercise that I feel like you are leading by example by doing, and viewers and listeners can do with strangers. Like, yeah. you can have, it doesn't have to be on television. And like you, we do this so that you are able to do this with other people and engage and like lean into your curiosity that you have around other people. And I think in a time today where everybody feels so isolated and distant from each other, even though we are all constantly connected, we need more of that. So what advice do you have for people who are feeling alone, but can find solace in stories? Well, you hit the nail on the head. We're so connected to so many people. We have so many friends, right, oh, on yes. social media. Yeah. But how, how often are we really connecting with people? You know, there are probably people in our lives that we may interact with on a daily basis, but do we even know their last name? Do we know where they live? The do last we know? name thing? Tr I just said something the other day. I was just like, in elementary school, we had name tags on our desks that said the person's first and last name, and that's why we knew them. And now it's like, you can go weeks with working for, with someone for the first time and never know their last name oh, until yeah. you see it in like an email signature. Yeah, I mean, just taking that time to look someone in the eyes and ask them about their day or about their lives. There, there is so much value in that. And, I, and I, I think that that's something that we can do day to day. You don't have to be a journalist with her own show to interact with people who are different from you. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, if, if you don't know most of the people in your neighborhood or in your building, then you're really missing out. Yeah. You know, and I, I think when when we were all kids, right, we knew everybody. I mean, I would I would leave my home and not come back until the end of the day because I knew that the people in my community were looking out for me and that if there were if I was doing something wrong, other parents would, you know, would had the right to, to discipline me or to let my parents know. And we've gotten away from that. I mean, we again, we're so connected to so many people, but how many real interactions, how much real connection yeah. do we have? 
I don't think it's easy though to, I mean, you're talking about getting to know people in your neighborhood, in your building and going out there and putting yourself out there to connect with people. And that's a really hard thing to do. It can come naturally to some people. Like obviously when you do this for a living, it comes naturally to you. So what, what would you say to people who really struggle with like putting themselves out there to connect with people and so that we can alleviate that, you know, sense of loneliness sometimes? I would say put your phone away. <laughs> and start just reaching out to people and and having conversations with people who are different from you. I mean, it, you don't, I've, we've had the luxury of being able to travel around the world, Yeah. but you don't have to do that. I mean, you probably live in a city mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there are parts of that city that you are completely unfamiliar with, right? Why not take a half a day and go out to that community and just kind of hang out and observe? Even if you don't talk to people, put your phone down and just look around. And you may strike up conversation with people about the most unlikely things, but you are putting yourself in a position where you're open to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just, I find, and I've been doing this a lot more lately, where impulsively when I'm, I'm somewhere, I, it, I, it's, it's instinctive to just grab my phone if I have that quiet time, right? But I have really, really been trying to just sit and observe when I go into a, a coffee shop or if I'm even like in a grocery store line. How do you get over the antsiness? I mean, I, 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 I think that when, when I engage people, it, it's almost like they're appreciative of being engaged. Of course, yeah. And... And those are when you have those moments. You don't have those moments when you're just like mired in your device all the time. Yeah. When you're really listening to people. And I just, I think that there's such, such value in doing that. Yeah, I agree. How is your heart today? My heart's great. My heart's great most of the time. I mean, there are are moments where I feel really, really sad about things or, you know, I come across something really devastating. But I do think that I'm an eternal optimist, and I try really hard to see the light in people. Yeah. Um, because we all have it. Every person, irrespective of what they have been accused of doing, has a light in them. They just sometimes have a hard time themselves being able to find yeah. it. Um, and we all, at the end of the day, we're all born of a, a mother who loved us. And somehow, because of our environment, we were set off course or things that ha happened to us as a young person or throughout our lives. But ultimately, I think we all want the same things. Yeah. And we've just gotten really far from recognizing that in each other. Well, I love you. I love you too. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. I always learn from you and I appreciate that. Likewise. You learn from me? I do. What have I, I mean, taught you? I love just seeing you out there in the world, Thank you know, you. and just being this beautiful, intelligent, vocal, opinionated woman who is just kind of doing you out there, you know, because I think, again, um, we, we all have these sort of um, internal... Um, Predispo we, we're predisposed to think certain ways about people. Yeah. And when I see you out there, just, I don't know, just it, 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 it gives me joy. It gives me hope. And I know when I see you that you are changing the way people might feel about yeah. things far and wide. That's my intention. I totally paid her to say that. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. No, it's true. When I, when I see you out there, I'm just like, I feel really proud that you're just, you're out there and people are seeing like the inner light that you exude. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to call you mom now? <laughs> I'm old. I'm definitely old enough. I'm probably older than your mom. I think we've talked about no, this. No, I think you, you're actually a little bit younger, like by a few years. Yeah, by a couple of years. Yeah. 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 My husband could definitely do that for sure. <laughs> This is now getting depressing. Okay, <laughs> bye! I'm trying to radiate that light still. <laughs> Thank you.